Hi there, I'm Danny Flexen and welcome to the latest edition of You Don't Know Shit About Boxing, a podcast brought to you by the team behind Seconds Out. And as always, I'm joined by my superlative co-host. Oh, a new word. Yeah. That one. <laughs> Miss Georgia Banks. Georgia, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm very good. Good, glad to be back. I feel like it's been, I feel like it's been forever every time. I'm not <laughs> it's absence makes the heart well, grow fonder, clearly. Um, we're going to get into all the big stories of the week, including, of course, the Eubank Junior Ben controversy. But before we do, we have to welcome this week's very special guest. Please welcome from Harrow Wheel, England, King Mitchell Smith. <laughs> I think that might be the only time we've ever used a Mark Burdis <laughs> intro. <laughs> no offence, Mark. Oh, How thank you doing? You, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm Welcome. good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You've got one of the more um, interesting stories in boxing. You're a, I want to say a child star, that's more movies and stuff, isn't it? But you're, <laughs> you're a young star, you turn pro young, you were on Box Nation, you were a fixture on there, very exciting fighter. And then the wheels kind of came off with the defeat to George Jupp, yep. um, who's now retired, I think, and yep. has got a normal job, a civvy job. Um, a or, civvy yeah. job. <laughs> Sensible like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, And then you had some other issues, of course, that kept you out of the ring for, what, five years? Yes. I guess just, just tell us the, the, the story of the, the absence from the ring, um, in, in your own words. So after the Jupp fight, I kind of... Obviously, I left Jason Rowland to move to Adam Booth. Everything was sort of in the gym was flowing fine. Uh, I can't knock Adam for anything. He, he was absolutely amazing at what he done for me inside the gym and and outside the gym. But my mental health was never a hundred percent. And I, and I think just in life in general, when you're not on track here, nothing else is sort of like it won't. Nothing will go to plan. And I made terrible decisions being around people that didn't have the right interest for me and unfortunately one thing led to another I found myself in custody in in, in prison um, and then when I come out of prison I got a ban from boxing um, suffered with my mental health for quite a little quite a little while um, drink drugs women um, and I've managed to uh, to get myself back on track. Uh, I was also went up to like 18, just over 18 stone. Jesus. So I was as fat as a pig. Um, I, was, I was big, I was heavy, I was I'm very unhealthy. Um, and then one day just something just was like, right, I need to do something with my life. And I don't really know a lot else about life apart from boxing. So mm. give it another crack. Um, yeah, now I'm sort of like, I'm here and back. And what, what was that thing that made you kind of sit up and want you to straighten out? I couldn't get off the couch. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, on, a, on a serious note, I think when, from some of the, the, the overdone and, yeah, overdone it with drinking drugs and, and the party life, when you, when you separate that life to your normal life, you start to see clearer. And the less I was with the people that I was around, the clearer I see. And then eventually, I, I, I still say it to this day, I think I just grew up overnight. Mm -hmm. I literally just woke up one day and I was just like, this ain't for me. I'm gonna try and straighten my life out. And step by step, I you know, started to get good people around me. And my dad was also one of them people, although we still don't talk now, but <laughs> uh, he's just like, he pulled me sort of back to my, back on back with my feet on the floor back back to where i where I should be in a good place he raised you didn't he him, yes he him did on his brother yeah yeah he, me and my brother was just with my dad and i had no mum. so um yeah man i just like one day i was just like i think i just grew up overnight man and and, and yeah that was that's pretty much it really before that did you kind of feel like it was just kind of like a downward spiral and you, you just couldn't i just get couldn't out get out of the hole i just mm -hmm. couldn't get out of and also because of it kind of sounds like cheap, but all, all I kind of know is boxing. So like mm -hmm. now I, I've kind of come to grips with it. When my boxing career is finished, I can't, I, w I won't be able to just walk away from boxing. It would just, I would have to do something involved in boxing yeah. because it's my life. It's all I know, whether it be coaching, managing, bringing up other younger fighters, whatever it is, it would just be to do with boxing. That mm -hmm. That's all I know. Um, so... 
Oh, sorry. What was the question? I've, I've, I've gone. If you felt like you were in a downward spiral, yeah, so you just I, couldn't get out. I just got, I couldn't. So basically, I don't even know where I was going with that question. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't see an end goal yeah. from the ban. That was it. Yeah. That's where I, that's where I was going from the ban because I was overweight when I come out of prison, so I was unfit. Um, my natural, my my natural. Um, my natural personality was quite lazy. Unless I was in a training camp for a fight, I didn't really train. I sort of didn't really tick over. I lived a really shitty lifestyle, mm. um, and I couldn't see my. I couldn't see a way out of right. I've not. I've got until 2021 to be able to box again. Like I don't know wh what I'm going to do with my life. I could started PT and PT and didn't really take off. And then before you know it, you just get involved in the wrong people. You're doing the wrong things, and forget about I, f I forgot about the boxing and just started focusing on what I was doing oh, at the right. present moment do you know what I mean um, so that's that's kind of I was just I was a little bit lost in, in, in what to do because I had so long I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. in a nutshell I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel so did mm. you ever get professional help for you? yeah I done counselling yeah. I done counselling did yeah. it help? Uh, well, not really I got kicked out of counselling, so... So, <laughs> kicked out. so the, the thing with me is I'm quite open about a lot of stuff. I just say it. Mm. I say it how I see it. Mm -hmm. Counselling, I would say, I'm not saying it doesn't help, but if you don't want to change or if you don't want the help, then it, it's not going to help. If you're not willing to take it in, mm. then it's not going to change you and you're not going to get to the bottom of, of what ever's going on um and i wasn't ready when i done the cancer and i wasn't ready to change so therefore it didn't it didn't really help for me what helped for me was like i said one day i just woke up and i was like this this ain't this lifestyle ain't for me no more i'm gonna literally get up and start losing some weight and and initially it was just let me start getting healthy again let me just mm. change some of the really shitty habits to some good habits whether that's waking up and trying to get through four four liters of water a day and literally just changing really small habits that were so from shit habits to really small habits and at the end of the day ticking off them them good mm -hmm. habits mm -hmm. making yourself feel better loving yourself again and then before you know it you're sort of two months down the line and you're doing what normal people are doing i've lost 15 16 kilos in weight and you can start to see it and then it was just a it has it's been i'm, I'm not going to say it's been all uphill since I've, I've i still fight demons every day and i think I, I i've i i've come to peace with the fact that i think i will forever fight demons because i'm not i'm not a straightforward person but i've learned to deal with them and i i i, I do love myself again and I know where I'm going in life and and that is quite a powerful thing I've come to peace with knowing where I'm I'm guiding towards if that makes sense we've done obviously a couple of interviews features boxing news I think the first one your dad was there for that and then we did one not long after you came out of prison mm. and you said at the time that one of the reasons the stuff had happened that ended you up inside was you know you got into a fight in a pub or whatever but it was more the area you were in and the people that knew you in that area mm. how much of a factor was that in the the path you were on at the time um I was just always I thought See now, now, I mean, now I look at it as I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't grown up enough to deal with the situation in a professional way. I was far too proud of a man and as a fighter that the only way I knew how to deal with them situations was fight fire with fire and mm. that was whether someone was mugging me off or trying to start a fight with me i only knew how to deal with it in one way whereas for starters now i don't put myself in positions that i did put myself in i mean i can't remember the last time i entered a nightclub for starters <laughs> i feel like an old man now um and just like putting myself in positions where <laughs> it's 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 kind of harsh to say but I mean, I went in prison almost six years ago now, and I drive past 
the same pub that I went to jail for, like in in the argument most most days of the week I drive past it that, that's you know that's my way to the gym because I'm still living just past the area I was living in but I never ever I'm seen I'm never I don't walk the street there when I go do my food shopping I do my food shopping in a completely different area because mm. I don't want anything to do with anyone that I was involved with I, I just don't want anyone to see me speak to me I, I don't like anyone around that area anymore but I guarantee you when I drive past that pub every day there are the same people in there doing the same shit and I just take myself out of them situations now you know and at the time I wasn't prepared I was I wasn't prepared I wanted to be the man of the area I wanted to be oh that's Mitchell blah blah blah, blah. you know what I mean it's great it's great when you're growing up but in hindsight I wasn't old enough to take a backward step and think this is going to get me into trouble you know there was there was a few incidents that happened previous to that the incident that put me into prison um that i could have been in there a lot sooner so there's a lot of debate about prison and if it's a force for change in people rehabilitation and so on what if anything did it do for you uh uh <laughs> made me enjoy my own company um <laughs> it's a tough one because i'm not going to say that i i shouldn't have been punished to prison but in the circumstances that i was in knowing how i'd been brought up and all i know is to deal with situations like that i'm not saying to excuse the situation but if you're a murderer and you go out and you kill someone, then you're a murderer. If you sit out there selling drugs to try and get yourself into trouble, then you're out trying to kill people as well. Do you know what I mean? You're doing you're doing wrong by the law. Sure. I attacked somebody that attacked me and I got a, a prison sentence, right? Okay, fair enough. In the eyes of the law, I'm wrong. Okay. If I do that in the ring, it's not wrong. It's right, okay? I'm allowed to hit somebody back in the ring. Of course. Blah, blah, blah. Did it rehabilitate me? I don't think it rehabilitated me. Um, I don't think, like I said, I don't think when I come out of prison, I changed. What I did realize is it was a waste of a year's, it was a, it was a waste of a year of my life. You know, I, I had a child at the time and it was like, I missed a year of my, my child growing up. I missed a year of my dad, my brother being in the gym. And then I'd also messed up the time I was going to, the time that I was going to spend on a ban when I come out of prison. Mm. So when when i come out i sort of realized i didn't it yeah it didn't it didn't didn't rehabilitate me because when i come out i knew how much i'd messed up and i went into a more of a more of a self-destruct mode and it was like i don't know where i'm going now in life i'm i'm all over the place i can't get out of this hole that I'm, and i've got nothing around me i've got no money still living at home with dad you know what i mean it was like i had everything at my and what was what what the hardest I, I still remember like even to this day like parts of me it still eats me up but i kind of like i'm at peace with it now but knowing what i had at my feet and what i was becoming in boxing now listen people can say you know oh, i should have been a world champion by now maybe maybe not but I know that I would have gone on to, if I'd have had the right head on my shoulders, gone on to have a house now or, do you understand, be comfortable in life. Now I'm still having to work. I'm 29 years of age, I'm still having to work. Whereas I messed all that up because of stupid decisions that I've made in life. So, yeah, there is there is, there is a lot of guilt, but I've come to peace with it and I know where I'm, I'm, I'm guiding towards now, so... What, what does life look like for you now? Like, what's your day to day? Uh, so most mornings I wake up um, and I will have clients that I train. So I've got a nice, uh, I say, I'd say between twenty five and thirty clients I train oh. a week. So I'm very, I'm very, very busy. Sometimes I do some twos and threes. I'm lucky enough that Jab Boxing have let me in there. Little shout out there. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so I'll get up, I'll have my diary set, I'll know exactly who I'm training at what hours. Um, I will know when I'm training, and then pretty much I spend a lot of my time in jab boxing. Like today, I think I've trained six people today, and then the time that I've had that I wasn't training, 
I was just in there chilling out with the other coaches. Mm. Like my coach is like my, like my best pal. He's like literally we hit it off and I met him. I met him before a year ago, but the, when we started proper like getting to know each other was like a year last week, and he's like my best pal. Like give him a shout out. We literally Azar. He knows <laughs> coach who Azar, he is. Yeah. Uh, coach Azar, man. He, yeah, Aaron has been. He's been an absolute gem, At, and and I think he he mentioned it in an iFilm London interview. Um, the thing with him was he needed to get me happy outside of the the uh, outside of the boxing gym because training for me has never really been an issue. When I'm in, when I'm in the gym and I'm training, I'm training. Yeah, I train hard. I'm focused. It's when I'm outside the gym, my head wanders. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? And he was like, he mentioned it in an interview. You know to get Mitch happy outside of the ring was was his main concern and now he's managed to do that I've got a steady income I haven't never I ain't got no problems about when my next pound note's going to be there and that's also a struggle in life in general um so yeah that, that's pretty much my day-to-day -day life weekends I spend with my kids because I don't really see them that much in a week how many kids you got so I got three step kids and two of my own children um which is it's difficult it's difficult because the older ones that are my stepkids they're going through their own mm. their own hormones and their own stuff they're like two, two older girls and and an older boy do you know what i mean so it is chaos but um yeah man i i make i make sure i make time so you know I, i'm i wouldn't say i'm like i said i'm not saying i'm 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 this absolute gem but I'm, i've come to peace of a lot of stuff in life and i know where i'm being guided towards and I'm happy in life right now you know great stuff now leads us neatly into this week's topic which is don't call it a comeback <laughs> he's been here for years <laughs> well, not here literally but, <laughs> yeah. um, but we're going to be talking about the process of coming back after a long break um, so yeah I guess first of all what were the main challenges once you fixed it in your head right I definitely want to come back now there was the suspension of course that was quite a big thing mm -hmm. why did it take so long to get your license back and what were the other things that you needed to do before you were ready to come back so I think I was banned until 2021 um, and then I couldn't get to grips on being on a strict diet I just couldn't do it I just I'd get a week into my Meaning diet, up. and then yeah, it's it, it's it's Any always. Tips? It's, yeah. I mean, I mean, my weight's never perfect anyway, but um, I just couldn't. Well, I was obviously like a hundred. I think I was one hundred and ten point eight kilos was the heaviest I see. Do you have a picture? I just can't imagine you that. Somewhere, I do somewhere on my phone. I mean, I've uploaded a few. My like, my belly was like out here. I've got like stretch marks on the inside of my legs and stuff. Where I was, I was very, very big. Um, so obviously, from 2021, I could have had my license, but I couldn't get to grips on 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 my diet. And then instead of looking at the long, long process of I've got to be minimum 66 kilos by the time I get back in the ring, which was what's that 44 kilos of weight I needed to drop right mm. I just done it by five every five kilos and I was doing it like 21 day like challenges basically like do 21 days have a day off do 21 days have a couple of days off whatever but it just it seemed to work because every time I looked at the end goal you've got to be 66 kilos it was like fuck I'm so far away man like mm. do I really need this in my life right now like busting my ass <laughs> every day it could be six months it could be eight months um so I just, I set myself small goals. So there was the weight issue. And then there was also finding stability of income training. There was just things that were in the way. And I remember Adam Booth used to call it the cracks of life. And it was just one of those. It was just things that popped up. And I'm sure I could look back now. I could have, sure I could have done things a lot better, but it, it is what it is you know I managed to get my license back at the start of this year and get myself down to 66 kilos which I boxed at just under the world weight limit um, which was still too heavy but I needed a goal does that make sense I needed a goal and we sort of had an, we sort of had we said sort of 10 stone is what we wanted to come back at was 63.5 mm. but the closer we was getting to it it was like we're not going to quite make that weight so we'll just get another because it was only going to be a body sure we'll get you know we'll get the opponent closer to the day so i managed to get myself down i think it's the way to 66.1 
and uh, boxed the lad that had boxed up at light middle and super uh, welterweight and super welterweight. And he was tough and he was a bit of a ball ache when, when we got in the ring. He was having a wall complaining to the ref. He got out the ring and then got back in the ring. It was all it was all a bit strange because you know I remember I was out of the ring five years as well. And when I when I was when I'd hit someone back in the day, obviously I'd hit them, the referee would either wave it off or you'd know like he's not getting if, I mean someone got out of the ring, for me that's like you're the fight's finished. Like, yeah. I remember jumping on the rope to my crowd and then turning around and he's back in the ring and the ref's <laughs> box on. I was like, whoa, I'm gassing here. I'm gassing. I'm gassing to gonna get cool this fight off. Um but yeah, so he, he was a bit of a he was a bit of a ball lake. Um and then I managed to get him around the body around five, which was a bit of a relief really, because mm -hmm. I was saying to Dan beforehand, um, come back after the fourth, and my trainer said to me, right. When you start throwing threes and fours now, start putting your shots together. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him, I was like, I can't throw ones and twos. I'm <laughs> absolutely gassing here. You forget how much like nervous energy and the, like the nerves get you. And when you're in there, it's completely different. You load up with a lot more because obviously the, the nerves and the worrying about getting caught back. And so I, I remember just saying to him, I looked at him, I said, I'm struggling to throw ones and twos. He went, all right, stick to ones and twos. <laughs> I, managed, I managed to catch him around the body and he took a knee. And then he sort of like the referee waved it off, and then yeah, happy days. It was a, it was it was a solid. Considering I was out the ring five years, and and I'd been I was out the ring five years, and I'd been stuck in the gym for six months, mm -hmm. with no no time off. It was a good performance. I was happy. And then disaster struck, um, hoping for a next fight before the end of the year, and you had broke a, your ankle. Had a, had a next day. Uh, I was five weeks, five weeks out of it. I had a week off after my fight. Sorry, I was just about. Um, <laughs> I'm not right. long at dinner. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. Until, until you smell the onion. Um, so yeah, um, I was five weeks out. Uh, I was using moped to get from A to B, and uh, I was coming home from a session in the morning. I tried to overtake a car, and as I've overtook the car, I've driven to an island that was in the middle of the road, uh, forty mile an hour. So yeah, next minute I found myself in in hospital. Um, and I've got like skin damage on the top mm. of my foot. And then yeah. basically it's a bit of a strange story, but they sewed me up on top of my foot, x-rayed me and then told me that it was just a sprain, sent me home in a boot and said, you're, you're good enough to walk. You're okay. Like just watch the cart, mm -hmm. keep the clean, uh, keep the foot out of water cause it'll take the plaster off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Two weeks later, I walk into the hospital to get the stitches taken out, and they was like, "Why, why are you walking?" And I was like, "Because you lot have told me that it's a sprain." Mm. And they was like, "No, no, no, we've left voicemails." Well, I don't. <laughs> yeah. One, I never checked voicemails, <laughs> and two, they didn't have my number. They had they had a different <laughs> right. number. Went and had another X-ray uh, because they said it was broken, and where I'd been walking on it. I'd also give my foot had given way a few times. I was like, there's something wrong here. And I remember, I still remember the evening, I went to let the cats out. And as I've opened the door, I sort of leant forward and where I've oh. leant on the side of my ankle, I could feel it crack. And I, <laughs> I, yeah, ended, up, gross, I yeah. ended up on my ass anyway. And I was like, sort of like pushed myself back to the, to the sofa. I sat up, I was like, there's something wrong here. So my dad borrowed me a set of crutches. I'm on crutches now. And then I walk into the, obviously the hospital. They rescanned it, and my bone had completely just separated oh. itself to my ankle. So the bone that was in my leg and my ankle had completely separated. Mm -hmm. So now what I've got is they've had to cut me open. So going from being a sprain to now I've had to be cut open, the bones be bolted back together, a plate on it, and now I'm being sewn back up. And that was I was sort of bed bound for sort of six, six, seven weeks. Then I was sort of like slowly walking back on it, but the rehab has gone well. Um, I've got a scan next week just to see if there's any tendon or ligament damage. But I'm back. I'm back punching. It's sta only static, but I'm back punching. I'm back doing rehab. I'm lucky enough to have a a decent physio in Adam Lovegrove. That's another shout out. <laughs> um, so they're doing well. They're doing, <laughs> I'm flexing I'm like, literally, on. I'm like this yeah. on, on my wrist, just yeah. looking. Yeah. To, um, so yeah, I've, 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 I'm lucky enough to have rehab most days now so mm. it, it will get back to where it should be i still feel like i've got a lot more to give mm. i was saying to dan earlier like i'm 29 so a lot of people are going to think that he's past it you know i had everything when i was younger but 
I am 29, but I still feel, I still feel 21. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I still feel young. I still feel fresh. I'm sparring good opponents, like English champions and 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 Commonwealth champions, and I, I, like holding my own. And that's that's a, like that's that's like now. Like, give me another time where I'm gonna have a few more warm up fights, and I'm ready to start doing title fight camps, and everything else starts picking up. I still believe that I've got titles in me, and I still believe that I. If I have to cause an upset along the line, then then that's what I shall do. I just can't believe you were walking around on a broken foot thinking um, it was sprained. But the thing like, is, I'm, I'm in the gym doing pad work still. You know what I mean? I'm in the gym doing pad work. Did you like, not think, oh, this hurts a little bit more than it probably should? Well, well you, you say that though, yeah. I'm, I, and my, my coach, Aaron, was like, get on with like, Because I was like, oh, God, can I take some more paracetamol, man? My feet can. <laughs> and he's like, get over it, man. It's a sprain, paracetamol for a sprain. I was like, yeah, but... Because when I was with Adam Booth, mm. I broke my foot in training in a mm. training camp and done a four week training camp in my in the fight before I went to prison. Done my last four weeks, but I never got an X-ray because I knew that they, the scam was going to be bad, and I needed the money, so I needed to fight. Mm. So I done four weeks on this foot that was really really sore, but all I just didn't do was I didn't run, so I sparred, I done my pad work, I done my bad work, my bag work. And then after the fight, I went to get to get a scan straight after my fight, and they said you've broken your metatarsal in your foot. So I'd done a four week training camp with a broken foot, like a broken metatarsal. So when I was saying it to Aaron, I was like, just trust me, man. I know something's not right here. He's like, nah, you wouldn't be able to walk if it was broken. I'm like, mate, I'm telling you, I, just me and the pain of like breaks, I suppose. Like I broke mm. my hand in the Zoltan Kovac fight in the second mm. round, managed to box ten rounds with or eight rounds with it. So I suppose my pain threshold. <laughs> the nails, yeah. <laughs> if Mitchell was looking for some inspiration in terms of coming back after so long, we can go over to the green room and mean Josh Green. Oh, sorry, lean Josh Green. Oh, I just rechristened him there. Yeah. Lean Josh Green will round up some of the best boxing comebacks uh, we've ever seen. Thank you very much, guys, and welcome back to the green room. I'm here today to run through some of the greatest boxing comebacks of all time. I've got four names for you now, starting with the greatest in Muhammad Ali. Of course, took around five years away from the ring in what was very much his prime due to spending time in prison and, of course, three years suspension from boxing. But he came back an even better fighter and an incredible character. I think the the people we see today in boxing, lots can be put down to Muhammad Ali, still one of the most famous names in the world of boxing, even today, and thought of in such high regard. And that's due to what happened really after his comeback. So he came back around 29 years of age and set the world alight and put boxing right back on the map. Next up, we'll talk about George Foreman, 10 years away from the ring. There's not many boxers or fighters today that could take 10 years away and come back an even better fighter. But that's what George Foreman did. Came back, strung off win after win after win, and eventually got a stunning knockout over Michael Mora to become the oldest heavyweight champion of all time, a record that still stands today. Third up, we've got Sugar Ray Leonard, um, a man that retired actually multiple times, but kept being dragged back into the sport. Um, really, I think a love of the sport was what, what did that. And I think something that probably could be said for all of the names on this list. They did have the time away, but they kept coming back to boxing. He, of course, defeated Thomas Hearns prior to his time away, which lasted around three years, but came back, beat Marvin Hagler, another secured uh, draw with Thomas Hearns, and Roberto Duran, a win over him as well. Really some incredible victories. And although he was very much in legend status before that three years away, I think he very much cemented that for following the time away. Finally, Sugar Ray Robinson, a man that took a break to really go into show business. Boxing wasn't quite his thing at the time. He was singing, he was dancing, um, but really very much staying away from the ring, but keeping himself in shape. He came back to secure a title at middleweight after previously securing world titles at other weights. So I think 
what can be said for all of these fighters they came back and really bettered themselves in their second spells and i think you would have to say all four go down as legends of the sport thank you very much back to danny and georgia step back thanks very much josh i'm sorry i called you mean <laughs> <laughs> won't happen again oh, I can't promise it won't happen again that's right he might not watch this <laughs> yeah, yeah fingers crossed know, he just if he does working. will he blink that's the question what do you mean because he doesn't blink does he have you not noticed no. our production team was talking about it off camera and I hadn't noticed it before but yeah oh, he, he keeps his eyes like wide open maybe Sorry. it helps him remember I always look off to the side when I'm trying to remember something I'm ah, like, oh, like a tell like if you're lying about something is it like that there you go so we talked about kind of more the uplifting stuff great comebacks hopefully Mitchell will add his name to that list mm -hmm. but we've had some rather darker stuff going on in boxing in the last week or so I'm sure you've not been immune to the news um, of Connor Ben um, drug test adverse findings for clomiphene I'm no PED expert but I know it's not good because it's banned for a start mm -hmm. um, and then the fight ultimately being postponed what did you think when you first heard that he'd failed the test if it is a failure or, or you'd, something had been found in his system? Uh, the way I look at it is these things just don't appear. They just don't just, you know, they don't just turn up. You know, every time I had a test and it was obviously negative, it's negative, do you know what I mean? And if you if something pops up, I can't see I can't see it being wrong. Like it, like I was saying, like something just doesn't just pop up. But in my eyes... And I'll, I'll, I'll come back and I'll apologise to, like, I mean, I don't know, but I'd apologise to his face if I was to be wrong about it. But in my eyes, he's cheated. Um, yeah, he's cheated. And, and in my eyes, he should be, anyone that cheats in professional boxing should be banned for life. And if I was to ever do something as stupid as that, I'd be expected to have the same, the same uh, punishment. I was like, it's not, it's not a game. It's not, you know, it's, Boxing, you don't play boxing. You know, you can get seriously hurt, let alone somebody having an, an edge on testosterone and having that little bit of extra, whether it be power or whatever. It's just, it's not right. It's wrong, man. And I think it, after what both their dads went through with what Gerald McLennan and Steve Watson, I think he should have known a lot better anyway. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, Michael Watson, of course, and Gerald McClellan. I oh, was at that fight, actually, the McClellan one. Um, Showing your age, yeah. yeah. just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I was two years old. <laughs> I was a baby in my mum's arms. Um, what a lot of people have criticised, as well as, you know, Conor Ben, who's taken a majority of the flack, is that the promoters seemed to pull out all the stops to, to keep the, the show on. on the road mm. until it was absolutely impossible. George, what did you make of that? It seemed to leave a bit of a sour taste for a lot of people. I just get the feeling, see, I looked off again, I need to like, <laughs> <get my> thoughts. <laughs> I get the feeling that if it hadn't have been exposed by the Daily Mail, I don't, I don't read the Daily Mail, I don't pay attention to that it. Mean either, but, but if it had, this if, week. if it wasn't exposed, that fight would have gone ahead. Both teams knew about that, allegedly. I'll say allegedly because I don't know. Um, by the 23rd of September, was it? I think there's Both an email yeah. being produced that says they were yeah. told on the 23rd. Both parties yeah. were allegedly made aware. That sh then should have been stopped. And I remember you asking me last time, what do you think about Eubank Senior uh, not wanting him to fight? And I was a bit like, oh, you know. Duh, duh. And if he knew about it, it all makes sense. Yeah, wasn't it around that time that he started? Yeah, I'm not, I'm, started, yeah, about pulling him out, I'm not yeah. sure, but it... It definitely all... But he's clearly in a bad but, place at the moment as well, you know, emotionally and stuff. Senior. Yeah, well, I guess if he's been very vocal about, you know, Eubank Jr. boiling down to a weight that isn't safe for him to. And he's, gonna, you know, didn't look safe on the exactly. scales. And he's said like numerous times, this is murder, the, the word he used. And... I feel for him in a way because he was overlooked. He was like, no, oh, sit down, like old man type thing. That was, that was the energy people <laughs> yeah. were giving him and they were pushing him to the side rather than, okay, first and foremost, he was a fighter. He's been through this. He's lost one son and this is his other son. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And he was just kind of discarded in that sense. Um, it does leave a bad taste in your mouth with promoters trying to push it. Um, I mean, to the extent of talking about taking the board to court, to force them to sanction yeah, it. I mean. it's and it's 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 really difficult because we haven't had the beat sample back yet, have we? I don't Although know if we ever will. I mean, it depends. Exactly. The, so the fighter or his my, team have got to ask to. Yeah, my understanding it. was yeah. that the fight could go ahead until they got that B sample. 
that was my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, I think I think you might be right now. Yeah, so they wanted to push it, get it through, and then would it have come out? I don't know. But to me, in my head, it just screams: this is how much money we've put into this. Is this is our revenue we're going to get from this? The money is more important than, than the wealth for, of yeah. The, yeah somebody's life, and that morally doesn't sit well with me. I mean, the B sample is very, very rarely different from the A sample because they're from the same specimen. Mm. It's only mm. if, you know, contamination in the lab or something yeah. like that, which is very rare. No, but that doesn't mean there's not a reason why it was in its system, like no, an innocent yeah, definitely. explanation. Definitely. I don't know, but it doesn't look great for the sport. No, but I think, obviously, uh, Tony Sims and Connor Ben have both said, like, protesting his innocence type thing and I really really from like the bottom of my, of my heart hope he is innocent and he can prove that he is innocent or it's mm. you know a miscommunication of some sort I just don't know if we're going to get that that's what I'd like if you were in his situation assuming mm. that he believes at least that he's innocent how would you kind of play it? Because I know he put us something on Instagram, was it yeah. yesterday or the day before, saying, um, hope, was it, yeah, I, hope I hope the, the apology is, is as loud as, loud as disrespect. disrespect. It's difficult, isn't it? Because if he's believed, if, he, if, he's, if he's left his diet or his, his nutrition in somebody else's hands and he truly believes that he is innocent yeah. and this comes out. It's hard. It's a hard I mean, I think, I, I think... If I, if I deep down inside knew, to my knowledge, mm. I hadn't have cheated, mm. I would be pointing the finger. Mm. I would be saying, mm. listen, this is who I've had on board. It's come up positive. I'm, I'm saying I'm, I sh it, it's, it's wrong. Mm. I haven't cheated. To my knowledge, I haven't cheated. But if it is, if it is right, these are the only people that knew what I was taking. Yeah. I've been being told by this person and that person what to take. I think that's that's the avenue that I would go down if, mm -hmm. like I said, deep down inside, I thought I was, I should, you know what I mean? If, if, if deep down inside, I knew I weren't cheating, but. Mm. But do you not think it's your responsibility as a I think, fighter yeah, to know I think what's it, going in your I body? Think it, I think it is, but I also, yeah, I, I mean, at that level, 100%, mm -hmm. I think you've got to have the, the final say of whatever goes in into because of all the of all the cheating that's going on mm. in in the boxing nowadays anyway let alone the stuff that we're not hearing about um but boxing is a is a difficult sport at the at the best of times and if he's if he's been cheated by somebody that knew he was taking it, then it means that his trust has gone fully into somebody, and yeah. which is also then quite, quite heartbreaking. Because yeah. if he does, look, if he's cheated, he should be banned, no matter whether it was his fault or somebody else's fault. Mm. But it's a sad story. You'll never get to the bottom of it, but yeah. it's a sad story if he thinks deep down inside he never cheated but somebody had cheated for him basically is what yeah. i'm trying to get at and it would it, it, uh, like like georgia was just saying i'd love for it to come back and say you know the sample was wrong or whatever but then could that be bullshit could mm. somebody be paying that off look how much money that is gen like georgia was saying look how much money is generated in mm. in that fight alone let alone what comes from that you know what i mean it will something will always stem from that you know what i mean they're talking about kelbrook coming back or liam smith they they they, they both do numbers with the winner yeah. do you know what i'm saying so i don't know i don't know boxing stinks man boxing yeah. stinks and i'm in it so it is what it is like i'm I, I, all i want to do i try and stay out of the politics side of things so i won't i won't sit there and 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 have an opinion on the promoter's view of 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 the situation because <laughs> I want, I want a contract. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> um, but um, no, look, it, boxing obviously stinks. There's a lot of shit that comes through boxing, and uh, like I said, I just try to stay out of politics. But it, it is a, it is a shame because it was a fight that I was really yeah. looking forward to. Although I see it only one sided, I thought Eubank would would have beaten him fairly easy because of the size difference. Maybe the weight would have would have played a difference. But he did look very lean. He did look very lean. Like he didn't look like he'd just done just water cutting. He looked very light like, lean as Strong. his hips were dr like mm. lean and like I bet his body fat was very, very low. Um But yeah, I'll just try and stay out of the politics. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I am guided. I am guided that the yeah. situation had been called off, but it's so what it is. Just going back to the promoter question. Mm. 
from my understanding, um, the clomiphene is only banned in VADA and not UCAD. No, because UCAD go by WADA and it is banned by WADA. Oh, they don't test for it. There was yeah. something. There's no, like there's it. discrepancies that, in the test. I think test, that is it. The VADA yeah. test for a lot more things than that's UK. It. Yeah, so, so that was why they were trying to. For or yeah, not. so I think that's why they were trying to push the fight because they're saying from UK point of view, they don't test for it. It's Which not is come the up. Board, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that was their kind of way into pushing the fight, whether that's right and or not. Get out of jail, maybe. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, you've heard what we think about the situation. Um, listen to some of the experts we've got uh, Gabe Montoya who knows more than anyone I know about PEDs in boxing and also Joe Cordina a stable mate of Conor Benz UCAD doesn't recognize VADA as their testing agency and they did their own tests and Conor Benz passed their tests they don't have any legal recourse to suspend him it's kind of a weird gray area I, I feel like you know we know that VADA works they catch people all the time um and fights have gone on when Vada caught somebody, but the, the local commission didn't recognize them. You know, the Oscar Valdez fight is, is uh, that example. Uh, I think it was USADA that caught Eric Morales in the rematch with Danny Garcia and let that fight go on. That was the first precedent. Um, I think at this point, we know that they work. And I really think things need to change and that people need to acknowledge who Margaret Goodman is to the sport. She's now an International Boxing Hall of Famer um, for her work as a medical professional in the sport. Uh, Vada's caught a, a, quite a number of people, way more than USADA ever did. Um, and I just think it's time that the commissions need to get on board here before a death happens. Or, you know, we're probably already seeing serious injury from people being hit by people on PEDs. We, you know, if, if Vada's catching this, this few people with their budget, uh, or, you know, this amount of people with this, that, that kind of small budget. Imagine if, like, Elon Musk said, hey, let me throw a billion at you guys and have a good drug testing program and test everybody all the time, all year round, which is what I think needs to happen. I don't think we need to extend, um, you know, the, the, the suspension times, you know. If we're looking at, like, you just step out and look at, like, the U.S. drug war, right, and how – uh, you know, p putting people in prison, it's just gotten more and more and more, 20 years, 30 years, and yet drugs are, are readily available more so than ever. They're cheaper, easier to get. So obviously it's suspending people doesn't really work, but if you tested people more often year round, that deterrent factor would actually become a real factor. You'd catch people more often and maybe then things would level out. But I would add, I would add two other factors. Uh, like Jean Pascal tested positive for EPO twice. Uh, for him to get his license back, he would need to join VADA in my world year round, never stop. He would also need to tell us where he got those drugs and from whom. That way we could get that person out. I know Connor very well. We train together. He's a very, very good friend of mine. And I don't believe one bit intentionally he'd take something. One, there's too much money at risk. Two, he's not that way inclined. And three, he knows if it was, he, yeah, and three, he's getting, he's getting drug tested. So if he, if he's taking something, he knows it's going to come up. It just don't make sense. So for me, deep, deep down in my heart, and I'm, I'm thinking with my heart, but I'm also thinking with my head. It just, it's not making sense up here, but I believe he wouldn't do that. Um, people think different. I know boxing and everything else is a very fickle sport and, a fickle sport so um i know people will be jumping on it which i have seen even people are trying to slander me and i've never failed a drug test in my life I've, I've i've had more drug tests in boxing i've been boxing 15 years coming up uh more drug tests and some people have had chinese takeaways so okay. Well, yeah, so we've heard what those guys think and what's not been the best week for boxing but let's get back to more positive things Mitchell, you're healing up. Wow. Yeah, I know. You're the positive. You're the light at the end of the tunnel. It's mad, isn't it? Jesus, this is a bad show. Well, what we've got, do you know what I mean? Oh, Are you, you glad you came? Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, mate. You made me feel good. But you are, you are on a comeback. Yes. Uh, looking for fight number two. But as you alluded to before the clips, you need a promoter, right? Well, in, a, in a hindsight, in it. <sighs> Best, best case scenario, yeah, I get signed by somebody and somebody gives me another crack at the at the whip. Um, 
in which case I will have one comeback fight, maybe two, uh, on a decent promotion, and then with jump no in broken foot this time. With yeah, with yeah. no broken yeah. foot, um, <laughs> and then jump back in at titles, um, which would be either at super feather or at lightweight. Um, worst case scenario, and I have to fight on another small hall show. I will probably just have one warm up fight. And then just go back to being a gobstrite and start calling people <laughs> that. And that. That is literally yeah. whoever's holding. Stop there. Get ahead whoever, of the game. Listen, close close mouths don't Who do you want? I'm not, <laughs> listen, I, do you know what? Do you know what? I'm not even going to say names because I'm not one. I'm not ready yet. Mm. Two, I won't be ready to fight for titles until April, May next year. Anyway, so I, I'm not going to sit here. It's eight months away from from there and and start calling people out. But whoever has titles at that at that specific moment, I will be calling out. And it, like I said, I said to you a minute ago, I'm not in boxing to have to gain any more friends. I wanna mm. I wanna win some titles. I wanna earn some decent money, and I wanna get the hell out of here because I've spent enough time damaging my body and. Uh, yeah, I'm just. I just want. I want to get in, win some money. If if I if I, in my head, I still think I can. I can fight for world honors. Whether whether that actually happens or not is either here or there. Maybe people call me deluded. Maybe people call me arrogant, overconfident, whatever. I know what I can do. I know how good I am. I know what I feel like I can do. If it doesn't happen, I'm at peace with it. I said to you earlier, I'm at peace with whatever happens from now until then. As long as I live clean and I live and do everything to the best of my ability whatever happens is it happens man whatever happens from now is a bonus why do you think one of the major tv promoters hasn't taken a punt on you yet in this second incarnation i've got one foot done <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, I thought it was just broken. No, 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 <laughs> you make history. Yeah, yeah. Off like that. Um, no um i don't know maybe maybe because Maybe because at the time I remember speaking to Frank Warren and there was the Tyson Fury, Dillian White fight coming up at the time. So there was a lot going on in the Warren's office. Um, uh, I think there was a couple of people who spoke to Wasserman for me um, and there was a big card going on and they just started with Channel 5. So there was a lot going on in that office. Um, Eddie just ignored me. Um, <laughs> nah, um, I just think I, I think maybe just things weren't just things didn't add up. It just didn't materialize, and 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 I you know I chose to I just said to my coach, you know, look, just get me on any show, get me out there, just get my get my face back in the ring, so that people know that I'm serious and it's I'm back as a pro, and you know, and I, I said to him, look, make sure, like get me someone I could chin do you know what I mean like which which ended up happening but the kid ended up being a lot tougher than than, than what I expected because obviously fighting like lightweights when I was smaller and when I was hitting lightweights I was denting them when I was hitting this fella it was like oh he's still in front of me this, <laughs> this ain't fun um, so yeah like I just I wanted to just get a win under my belt and then I and then I was supposed to box on a war in management and uh, is it Nielsen Nil yeah Mark Nielsen. Nielsen, Mark Nielsen show and then obviously the crash happened so my, like I said best case scenario I get a, I get picked up by someone worst case scenario I'll fight on a couple of small shows and I'll call out whoever is holding titles and I don't. I, I don't care who I fight. I'm. I, I, I'm. I'm not going to get any stronger. I'm not. I'm not going to get any better than what I am now. I am who I am, mm -hmm. and 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 I'm not going to change as a fighter. I'll get in there and give it my best shot against whoever is put in front of me. And I still feel like I can beat a lot of the Brits out there at the moment. So especially a lot of the Brits anyway. Good stuff. Well, we've got some questions for you from our audience. I think that's one one there. Yeah. <laughs> Not no, of no, interest. We, I was like, happy days. We got more platforms. This, this ain't going to take long. Nobody uh, we, ever responds to me, so it, it's, it's just big. generally. Yeah, generally. Yeah, I can put anything out. No, I think we made it up to three in the end. Oh, what? So there you go. Nice, I'm I think this is the one you've seen. So this is Roy Kelly, who uh, works for a number of media outlets, including Seconds Out. Says, uh, I remember interviewing, reporting on Mitchell when he beat Peter Cope for the English title in 2014. Mm -hmm. Feel old now? Yeah, I do, yeah. <laughs> he looked an exceptional prospect then. How far does he think he can go now? And send him my best wishes, please. Oh, that's nice of him. Um, how far do I think I can go now? Hmm. 
deluded or not, I still think I can win a world title. I do, I really do. I still think I've got the potential, providing I live right. And I think my skills are good enough skill set to win a world title. And I think I hit hard enough. I think I'm strong enough. It's It would all be down to whether I live right from now until whenever I get a shot. I still think I can, I, I still think I can win a world title. And this one's from Andy White. And he oh, says, he did send something Ultimately, in. he did come back to me. He never lets me down. <laughs> um, he said, you've only, you've only had two fights in the last five years. Mm. Do you feel like you've wasted that time or do you think some things happened in that time that have been beneficial for you overall? Uh, in terms of boxing, I think I've wasted it. In terms of life skills, I think I've gained a lot. Um, I've grown up, I've matured. There's a lot of things I take as a pinch of salt now, man. I've got a handful of people around me and I couldn't really give a shit for nothing else. So, and and, and I do, I, I, I would tell young fighters to do exactly the same, you know? I remember my dad used to tell me, count your friends on one hand. Trust me, that's what will happen. Mm. And he was right, mate. You know, you, you think you've got all these entourage and people around me. And I did, it was almost like a mini entourage. I. 30 people come into my like weigh-ins with me do you know what I mean I didn't need that it was a lot of shy um, so in terms of life skills I think I've I've gained a lot in terms of boxing I think I've wasted a lot because I got as fat as a pig and very unhealthy so yeah that's pretty much yeah pretty much it really alright and um, at Rick the Boss on Twitter see someone did respond to you John. I like Rick the Boss man he's always tweeting <laughs> me I don't know who he is but he's always <laughs> tweeting me he says um, better I, be positive now <laughs> that's, a shout out. that's a shout he out. says I'm always tweeting Mitchell and I hate him <laughs> <laughs> uh, he says I'd be interested to hear how you got into boxing as an amateur if I remember correctly you trained in Welling Garden City but lived in Harrow Weald that's quite the journey what made you decide to go to that gym so uh, the reason why I got involved in boxing is I was six years of age and I was being bashed out of the school and Aww. it wasn't fun and I used to go home and cry to my dad and my dad was like obviously I can't go and bash a six year old up to <laughs> you're gonna have to do it you can't um, yeah. no one finds out I mean <laughs> that's that's six. Yeah, yeah. innocent not until proven school. guilty <laughs> um, it's not the only reason no yeah um, so he took me down to boxing gym um, started off at Harrow Boxing Club which is in my area nice and local uh, moved from Harrow to Bushy just because it was a it was a, a better boxing club and it was literally down the road I think it was about five, four or five miles down the road it's where the Shinkwins went wasn't it Bushy that's right Dan Shinkwin Mick Shinkwin run it my dad then joined the club um, and helped train uh, the other fighters full of young prospects good fighters good sparring I, I went on to win the national title every year from the moment I from the moment I walked in the gym every year I won a title so I won two NABCs back to back junior ABA senior ABA's first year in it um, and then so no so no I won two NABCs of junior ABA's and Dan Shinkwin said to me you, you, I'm not putting you in the in the senior ABA's because you're too young it's your first year in it just do another year of uh, club bouts and at the time there were, I weren't getting many club bouts I, you know, I was 60 bout boy I weren't not many kids around there wanting to do club bouts as both 60 bout boys because you're going to meet in the championships anyway um, and I was like I'm not going to box unless I'm in the championships so I'm I'm going to I'm going to hang the gloves up basically and I'll come back next year or closer to the championships next year um, in which I was 18 at this point right so women and boost was uh, was on my mind as well <laughs> um and I was actually sat in a pub and my dad rung me and he was like, you know the championship's seven weeks away? I was like, dad, we've had this discussion. Like, leave it, forget it. He was like, no, 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 just listen. I've got a way forward. Welling Garden City will put you in the championships, but you have to have a fight with Welling Garden City to enter the championships. Yeah. You've got a box for their club. I was like, dad, man, I'm like seven kilos over, like overweight. Like I'm unfit. I haven't trained for five, six weeks. He's like, yeah, yeah, we'll find you somebody. So anyway, he found me a kid called Dave Leo, who also boxed as a pro, right? Sab Leo's son. No, he boxed out oh. of Cheson. I don't think he's Sab Leo's son, but oh, he boxed okay. out of Cheson. Anyway, he was a man. I was an 18 year old boy. And believe me, I found out about it when I got in the ring. So anyway, right, it was like, he was like, I was like, so when can this all be sorted? Right, we've got a club show in two weeks time. So I had like, 13 days training of having five, six weeks out. And then I was fighting in the under 57 kilo championships 
but I weighed in at 63 to fight uh, Dave Leo. And we just had a Barney for three rounds, three threes. First time I've done three minutes as well. I was gassing. And then I remember I got out the got out of the ring after I won on a close points decision. Um, and I was like, I'll, n I'll never win the championships boxing like that. It's not a hope in hell's chance. Like you'd have looked at him and been like, this, he won't even come out the first round. Um, and then I went on. I went on and won it from like from there. So it was, it was a bit of a. It was. It was. It was. It's a good. It's a good story if that makes sense. It was. It was nice. I've had a few things that's done like that's happened in my career. Like I, I boxed on the same day my daughter was born as well, which is also a massive achievement for like men like mentally. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's one of those. How does your missus feel about that one? Uh, <laughs> the fact that you weren't there. Well, it's getting, no, no, no. <laughs> what, this, this is this is how weird it was. Like it was. It was the morning of my fight. Right, I'd box a week previous, which is close to her due date. And then she, and then I got offered three days before. Frank rang me up. I was like, "Look, we've had a pull out on the on the Hilton show. Mm. It was like a dinner show. Do you want to fight?" I was like, "What money?" He was like, "Same money as last week." I was like, "Happy days, like two purses in one week." <laughs> when you're just starting out, I think it's my fifth fight. I was and like, just yeah. had a kid. Yeah, just, <laughs> just having a kid. Like, I was like, "Yeah, happy days." So then. Uh, the morning of the fight her waters broke I was like whoa whoa we can't have the baby now she's like I haven't got no choice like yeah, it's, yeah. it's happening whether you like it or not um, and then I went up to the hospital happy days an hour and 45 minutes out kissed the baby on the head went up weighed in boxed <laughs> come back and then spent some time with the kid so yeah it was uh, some good stuff I've had some good times in boxing good stuff uh, Georgia, I believe you've got the results of our poll uh, that we put out about the best comebacks in boxing history. Hold on me right now. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll just fill time while Georgia uh, makes her way over to her phone that was charging. Imagine you got the shock then. Yeah. <laughs> Live. The whole thing would blow up. Live, yeah. Oh like gosh. Across the, the most viewers we've ever had for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Morbidly. You're really mean sometimes, you know that. Only sometimes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Come on, Georgia. I seen it was on aeroplane mode. I've been charging so I can get home. Why is it on aeroplane mode? So it charges quicker. Did uh, you not do that? No. Maybe I will now. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. But... So. So. What we got? <laughs> what we got? So uh, there's still three days left, and I've only got 19 votes. So it, my Twitter game needs to go. Up. <laughs> so, Why are you scheduled the poll to end after the show? Because <laughs> I like to see the end result. Well, it's going on. well nobody else is going to find it. Uh, okay, so who had the best at boxing comeback and why? So out of 19 people, 42% said Ali. 37% uh, said Foreman. 5% Leonard. 16% Robinson. Mm. And mm. Batman837 says, <laughs> it's a tough one between Ali and Foreman. For me, I both voted for Foreman because he had come back to boxing after 10 years and then became the oldest heavyweight champion in history at 45 years old. I don't want to see anybody fight at 45 years old. I'm not going to lie. I'll be happy to see 45. <laughs> oh, gosh. The way, I I was the, way, the way my like, last 10 years have been, I'll be happy to see 45. Don't say that. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> Back on the supplements now. Clean, clean. Here <laughs> <Hey. Hey> first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you've heard what uh, we've had to ask Mitchell and what the audience have had to ask Mitchell, but it'll be taking on a very different line of questioning when we come back in the hot seat. This game is called The Worst People in the World. Are you ready? Whether I have to look at you or... Uh, at straight... Oh, yeah. Straight ahead. Got you. Yeah, there I'm you go. on it. Let's go. Okay. So, the people who drop their gum shields in the gym and put them straight back in their mouth without rinsing it, or people that don't wash their wraps? Oof. This is what? What's this called? The worst people in the world. I don't do either of them. I mean, I do either. Of them. I, I don't wash my wraps or I don't. I just put uh. them in the gum shields. Um. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. The people that don't wash their wraps because in the middle of a sparring session, mm -hmm. it's just like adrenaline's running. Pick it up, wash it in, get on with it. So yeah, I'm gonna yeah. go with the wraps. Okay. People who cheat workouts and don't give a hundred percent, or people who spar to injure. People who what? Spar to injure. What does that mean? So like really, really hard spars, but take it a little bit too far. I don't think there's such a thing. No, oh, so. there is. So say like. I mean, every time I spar, I, I, I'm, I'm in it as if I'm, a, I'm, I'm having a fight. So. Okay, so say somebody was maybe a level or a weight above you. Okay, and then that's different. And they're taking a piss with you. Yeah, then, that, then I'm going to go for that then. Okay. I'm going to go for that. 
people don't put their weights away in the gym and they just leave them all over the floor or people who are on their phone the whole gym session oh both irritate me so much <laughs> i'm gonna go for i'm gonna go for the phone yeah. i'm gonna go for the phone in the hand instead of working out it's quite irritating people who miss the spit bucket in the gym <laughs> or people who kiss their dog on the mouth uh, <laughs> no nah, people that kiss their dog on the mouth no way sorry to those that kiss their dog but no way i've seen what dogs can do <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> jealous or what? And I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Let's oh, go. People who eat with their mouths open or people who cough and sneeze on you on public transport? People that cough and sneeze on you on transport. People who don't use deodorant and put their arms up next to your face on the tube or people who phlegm in the sink? People who... People with the bad underarms. Um, if you could change one thing about boxing, what would it be? If I could change one thing yeah. about boxing, what would it be? Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see more Brits fight each other wor than worrying about what, uh, losing their O. I'd have like more fights, 50-50 fights earlier on in their careers instead of worrying about the fact that if I don't win this fight, then I'm going to be thrown to the bottom of the pack. And would you rather have a glass chin or pillow fists? Pillow fists. Really? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Sweet. Cool. <laughs> Happy days. <laughs> Well, that was absolutely sweltering. <laughs> I always wonder what, what like adjective you could use. I didn't have enough time to think. I'm sure I've used sweltering like, um, before. Uh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just really, really hot, right? <laughs> just find a word for it. Oh, God, um, really appreciate you watching. As usual, please give us a like, a subscribe, comment below with anything that we talked about, whether it's Mitchell's comeback or the Eubank Ben situation. Please don't bully us. <laughs> yeah, I can't, bully can't Mitchell, we can take it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had them years, man. I don't need. Again. <laughs> you're a new man you can deal with it now true, true. we're very sensitive so <laughs> uh, Mitchell really really appreciate you coming in yeah, it's a it's a gripping story yeah, we hope it's a happy ending it will be it will be great thank stuff thank you for having me no, thank you for Anytime. coming and being so open and open minded it's not easy so thank you thanks very much guys and we will see you all in a couple of weeks yo Danny Flexen here think you know shit about boxing there's only one way to find out Listen to the full podcast via one of the links in the description or go to secondsoutboxing.podbean.com. You know shit about boxing.